the center is about and what it's for. And um, I think the best way to explain that is to talk about what um, what uh, Forio's mission is as an organization. So Forio's been around for about 15 years, a little over 15 years now. And the mission of Forio is to help modelers who've already built a model, um, typically with Vensim, PowerSim, or Stella Pro, to share their analyses with non-modelers. Um, and so increase the population that can benefit from system dynamics by orders of magnitude. And you know the, the tools that you all are using, things like um, uh, Stella Pro and, and Vensim and PowerSim are great tools for building models. And they can be good tools for sharing models, but it takes a level of trust to, uh, to share them. And what I mean by that is if you want to share a model with someone using any of those, say, say uh, um, Vensim, for example, then what you need to do someone is, is say, well, why don't you install, you know, like for Vensim, you might say, install Vensim PLE so you can get a chance to look at this model that I created. And once you've installed that, I want you to download this model file that I have, or, you know, that you maybe email them or something like that, and then try it out and I'll guide you through it. And it's sort of a lot, a, a big process to involve them. Um, and so it usually means that you're only uh, reaching a handful of people. Um, you know, the System Dynamics Conference occurred a couple weeks ago, and that, you know that's off, often an opportunity for people to reach more um, a bigger audience as well with their models. Maybe a model that someone's been working on for six months or even longer, um, they can reach maybe you know a hundred people at the conference. So what I'm showing here is originally the model builder might be one or two people, and uh, if you attend the conference and share a project that you're working on, you're reaching maybe two orders of magnitude more people, right? Maybe a maybe hundred people or something like that that you're going to be able to um, talk to or share a model with at the conference if you have a talk at, at somewhere or something like that. But if you publish your model online, you're going to be able to reach far more people than that. And there are some examples of simulations that have been built on our platform that have reached millions of people. So we've gotten up to like a couple million people on the platform for some examples, but it's not uncommon, you know, for more typical examples to reach, you know, several thousand people, maybe 10,000 or so. So again, opportunity to go up by um, maybe a couple more orders of magnitude by publishing your model online. And, you know, there's, there's tricks to this too, in the sense that when you have, when you're reaching, instead of reaching say five people or even 50 people, um, when you're when you're getting up into the thousands, there's a different approach for how you're sharing your model, and we're going to get into some of that today during this webinar. But the key thing about it is that um, the the people who are accessing your model through a browser are not as um, they're not as committed to the analysis, and so or not as committed as to to walking through everything. So you need to do things in terms of the design to make sure that people can understand what you're doing and uh, they're able to get value from it fairly quickly and things. So let's talk a little bit about what Forio Epicenter is then, is this platform. So it's this computational platform for hosting server-side models and creating interactive interfaces on those models. So you can host a, uh, you know, a PowerSim, Stella Pro, or Vensim model or other, other kinds of models as well. And then you can create an interface on, with those models you either, using either kind of a drag and drop tool that's called the the, the UI or user interface builder, um, or you can also use uh, HTML if you want to write it yourself. And, um, and uh, then you can share those on web and mobile. And a, a lot of the interfaces that are being built these days work both on the web, but also on smartphones so that the interface will show up, even if it's a web-based interface, it'll show up really well and work well on a smartphone phone as well. And so Epicenter can share simulations, obviously, but it can also share other things. It can share other kinds of analyses, including things like machine learning and optimizations, spreadsheets, that sort of thing. So this is a range of some of the languages that are supported on Epicenter. Um, so at the top here, you see Vensim, Stella, and uh, PowerSim, but it also supports things like Python, uh, R, and Julia. Those are kind of technical computing languages that have libraries that go with them where you want to do things like, say, Monte Carlo, or do statistical analyses of, of results from your model and things like that. You can you can add the, in those things from it, or completely build your model in one of those languages. There's um, someone who's built a, a system dynamics Python library, for example. I think they call it PySD, and that's something that will work just fine in Epicenter through the um, through that Python module, and then other languages as well. Uh, we're doing a lot more with Excel these days. You're also seeing things where we're supporting optimization, uh, things like Cplex, which is represented here by IBM. IBM owns Cplex, which is a solver 
Gorobi is another kind of solver and so forth. So anyway, there's a wide variety of things. But for today, because we're focused on system dynamics, we're going to focus on, on these languages at the top here. And what I thought I'd do to start off is to show you some examples of some interfaces that were created that, um, that were done not by people here at Forio, but instead by people who are users of the Epicenter platform and, and kind of show you what they've been able to build up and, and how it works. Because, you know, my, my hope today, in addition to showing you how the platform works, is to inspire you to build um, interfaces on your own and simulations that you can share with your colleagues or maybe customers or something like that. So let me just jump into that. I'm going to switch over here to uh, the screen. So this is an example here of um, a simulation that was created by a Dutch economist. And uh, the way that this person started, uh, Tim, uh, he, um, he built a simulation for his class, and it's a macroeconomic simulation. It teaches the sort of the basics of macroeconomics theory. And he ran it in his, uh, with his students for a couple of years. And then he, since then, he said, hey, this is now ready for sharing with other schools. And he's reselling this simulation to other universities now as a... Um, uh, it's sort of a, a little business. Um, and uh, let me show you the simulation first. I have an account here on it that I want to just go through. The sim is, of course, called Econland. And there's some student videos that are available. I won't look at those right now, but some explanation of it. There's actually, interestingly, in the interface here, there's some explanation of economic theory. And it talks about you know aggregate supply versus aggregate demand and sort of basic frameworks of, of how, uh, you know, um, consumption, investment, and government expenditure works, and so forth, right? So some basics on, on, on economics there. And then what you can do is you can start off by beginning a new game, and you can look at different kinds of future scenarios for the economy, like the base case is sort of a, you know, a relatively easy one, but you can do harder scenarios with the roller coaster or stagnation or something. Um, and then when you get into it, you get a little bit of an explanation here about what's going on in the first year. Uh, and you're allowed to vary, as you would expect, you're sort of allowed to vary interest rate or tax rates or the corporate tax rate, and then um, submit your decisions. And then what it does is it produces outcome in terms of uh, how things have gone, and it gives you little faces to indicate, are you doing a good or bad job overall? And I'm doing reasonably well. I have a big deficit that I've generated somehow, so I need to maybe fix that, but otherwise I've done well. And then another nice thing about this one is it provides feedback from a policy advisor, which is parsed. Uh, sentences that kind of explain what happened based on these economic indicators that are in it. And, you know, what you do is you just, it's a simple turn-based simulation. You go round by round here and you kind of vary these things and, and try to do better over time. And then there's also various reports that are available too that kind of show outcome over time with this. So that's the, the what one person created with a platform um, on Epicenter. And what's kind of neat about this is that uh, Tim has created this website now that runs this simulation um, and you know sort of resells it and things like that so he has this explanation about what uh, econ land is about which we could watch here if we want to i won't do that right now and it talks about the platform and, and how it all works and things like that he's got uh, pricing information here and ways of signing up right away and um, he uses a, a a service for getting subscriptions in and then um you know, faculty can sign up and he uses Epicenter to kind of create those accounts for classes and things so that he can sell subscriptions and make them available for, in his case, six months at a time. And, you know, there's other resources available to He's kind of combined some other things in with it. But he's done a sort of a nice job of taking a simulation that originally was used for, you know, 100 or so students in a class and turn it into something that is uh, 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 an opportunity for distributing and reselling to other businesses and things. Another group that has done some interesting work, uh, actually, it's interestingly, another Dutch group, is uh, uh, Copernicus. And they've built this asset planning model. If some of you were at the System Dynamics conference, they demoed this a few times during the conference. And the idea with the simulation is that, it, it, you know, what's interesting about it, I think, is that they've combined a scenario planning tool with um, multiplayer simulation. And one of the capabilities of Epicenter is to support multiplayer simulations, and obviously also scenario planning simulations. But one of the things that Forio has never done, or actually I've never seen done before, is uh, combining scenario planning with multiplayer. But uh, the Copernicus folks did that, and this is something they worked on this spring, and they've produced it, and they're kind of sharing this with um, 
some uh, clients of theirs in the Netherlands. Um, and the idea is that uh, you have uh, three different groups or three different players, and they make decisions regarding outcomes for asset management, essentially, in the simulation. So right now I'm logged in. I won't go into the details right now, partly because I don't speak Dutch, but uh, you see Underhood here is a, one of the capabilities. And um, on one of these, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this mode in Chrome where I can go to different screens here. And um, let's see, I'm in the norm stelling screen here. And this is about the life of the asset. I do know this translation here. You can see it's originally set at 20 years. And if I go back to this screen, you can see it's set at 20 years here. This is like another player who's running the simulation. So let me go back to the norm stelling person. And if I say the life of the asset, I believe, is not 20 years, but instead 18 years, and I go to person one, what you can see is that's automatically updated. So this is sort of a, a bit of the multiplayer that things are happening simultaneously on the screen while running it out. And then you know someone can submit the scenario and, and advance it and then look at outcomes based on actually three different players' inputs into the simulation as they're running it forward. So here's the outcomes in terms of costs and euros for, um, for these assets, which are ships, I believe, in this case for the simulation that they all put together. So, so that's another example. And both of these first two, um, well, actually, I think, well, I know this one for sure was done in Vensim. Um, this is an example, just as a, another example that was done in PowerSim. Um, it's also running in Epicenter, but, and the approach is the same. It's just that, you know, we're uploading a different um, model and then we're creating an interface on it. And uh, um, so this um, one is around Tesla Powerwalls and Powerwalls are, not it, this has little to do with the cars that Tesla produces, but instead it's around um, having batteries in your garage or basement that are used to store energy from your solar panels. That, that's the basic premise of it. And uh, you know Tesla, in addition to selling, I guess they now sell the solar, uh, the rooftop solar as well. I think they acquired Solar City or something like that recently. But they also have these um, these power packs or power walls that you can install. Um, that they sell that's kind of in addition to these things. And what this tool does is it helps you analyze uh, how much, how many power walls you need in order to uh, meet your energy consumption uh, and the amount of energy that's being produced by your solar panels on your roof. And uh, the way this works is uh, it gives you some background information on what kind of appliances you might have in your house. And you can you know, change the number of people. If you change the number of people, it changes your energy consumption per day. And you can get into details of this too. Like I can say, well, you know, what's the pattern of usage for um, the fridge and equipment or television? So here, you know, you see some assumptions that have gone in here with television where we're assuming that around five o'clock, the TV goes on and it's kind of on in the evening a lot. And then um, it gets turned off most of the time um, in the night. And then it maybe comes on in the morning again, uh, you know, before work or something like that. So that's an assumption that the people who built this model put in here. Um, but if I want to, I can change. I can say, well, you know, actually there's some TV watching in the afternoon and actually not that much happening in the evening or whatever. So I can, you know, like you see in um, many of the tools that we're using for building the models, you can do this kind of, you know, dragging where you can change your assumptions for the scenarios here. And then from there, uh, it's, you know, taking this information and, um, and using it to make this prediction about how energy usage will work. But one of the big drivers for energy usage is uh, latitude, so where you live in the world. And right now it's, froze, it's on a, a, a spot in uh, Norway somewhere, um, but I'm not in Norway today, I'm in San Francisco. And in fact, if I put in our office address, let's see here, 1159, uh, is that, no, that's not right. That's our old office, yes. 2601 Mission Street. Uh, you can see um, one thing that's kind of neat about this is that it's um, we're using Google in this place, in this case. Um, it's using Google APIs to look up location and, be, and it recognizes from something, I don't know what, I think something about our IP address or something like that. It sort of has knowledge about where I might be. So even though 2601 is pretty generic, it could be any address probably in any city and in, well, in many cities anyway, um, it sort of recognizes, no, you probably mean Mission Street. And if I click on that, uh, what I can see is, there we go. That's the roof of our building right now that I'm sitting in. <laughs> and I could say, hey, I could, yep, I could put some solar panels up on that roof. And more importantly, um, from the perspective of the model is I get the exact latitude 
that I need for determining the strength of those solar panels on my roof that's going to be used for calculations. And so this is one of the interesting things about um, including models online is that you can bring in APIs from other sources and build uh, and build interfaces that take advantage of them to simplify the use of it for your end users, right? So if you asked end users here to enter their latitude, that's going to be uh, complicated for them often. You know, they'll say, well, I don't know how to calculate that or I don't know where to go to look it up. And maybe you could provide a link or something like that. But if you do it with, 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 the, uh, with the, this PowerSim folks did in this model, is you can have it um, looked up automatically and it really simplifies things for users. And that ends up with a better user experience and more usage for the uh, end model here. And then, I, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time just showing all these examples, but I'll go a little bit further with this. You can see the orange line here represents the sun rising and setting each day. So it's kind of coming up at six and setting, um, but it will vary, of course, from day to day. And then you can see here the power wall energy, which is a bit low, right? Because what's happening is the, the power wall kicks in around um, 8 p.m. or so, but by... Um, 10 p.m. it's discharged completely. So what this implies is that maybe we want to add a few more power wall units and then, you know, I'm going to end up with a better pattern here over time. So, um, and then uh, we can do things like view the sunniest day of the year in terms of, and what they mean by sunniest is um, the day with the most sun sunshine. It's not predicting the weather, of course, but it's just saying, you know, what, what the pattern is. And here's the least sunny day for where I am, which is in you know, in North, uh, the, the Northern Hemisphere is in December and the sunniest day is in, well, I don't know why it's in June here. That's interesting. Or in, in April. But anyway, you can see sort of the di these different patterns and things like that that emerge. Um, and then finally, what emerges from this is sort of the payoff and things like that. So this is a, um, a nice tool that was built up. Um, and then the last example I want to quickly share with you is one that uh, is a scenario planning simulation. And uh, this one is neat because it uh, is working in multiple languages and also uses some features where it can load different initial conditions from the model. So this was a model that was built by Gary Hirsch uh, uh, two or three years ago, and um, it, it was delivered to Vietnam and it was looking at AIDS and HIV, and it was, and it was trying to um, help clinicians and city officials in Haiphong and other locations. They, like, for example, I can change this to Dien Ben, for example, on the western side of Vietnam. And what it does when I switch that is it, it kind of retunes the model to represent that lo location. But let me leave it at, as Hai Phong for now. I can log in. If I'm allowed to log in, then what this is called authentication, right? And so if I'm logged in uh, using authentication, I can um, store my scenarios from session to session. Um, but I can also go in as a guest and run this out. And uh, what this allows me to do then is to um, look at initial conditions here and start the simulation. Uh, and then I can do, you know, some experiments where I change some conditions here. Let me, you know, like I can, for example, do a bunch of things where I increase uh, prevention. And uh, I'll call this my prevention scenario. And then I have this new line that shows prevention on here. And, you know, and then I can add additional scenarios if I want, and I can look at outcomes and things like that. And, you know, this interface, when this was built a couple of years ago, took a fair amount of time. I think it took a month or two or something like that to put this together. And, and But things have progressed even since a couple of years ago. And now this is a type of interface that you can build uh, fairly quickly. Like this would be something that we can build a similar style interface with an existing model in the remaining part of our webinar today. So that's what I want to show you. Um, but before I do that, I want to jump away from these examples and uh, talk a little bit more about the authors and the approach for authors that we use for Epicenter. So there's really two uh, different types of authors or people who use Epicenter for building interfaces. Uh, and one here is represented by this person is um, the lone modeler who's working on his or her own developing a, uh, a simulation. A model using, you know, Vensim, PowerSim, or Stella Pro, and um, this person typically wouldn't have experience developing interfaces and probably doesn't know much or any HTML. And so we want to be able through Epicenter uh, to help this person create a nice interface that's going to work well, even though this person isn't going to have a background in, say, user interface design and things like that. But there's another audience out there that uh, uses this plat our platform as well. And this is um, a team of people 
who come together to build what we think of as a high production value interface, which means that it, you know, it's more polished and it has a UI designer who's maybe choosing uh, the colors and things like that and placement of objects on the screen. You'll have a modeler who's involved, who's uh, building um, a model with one of these tools. You might have a web developer, you might have QA. If you have all those people working together, you typically would have a project manager. So all those people are kind of coming together to build an interface. And uh, we want those people to be able to uh, build simulations on the Epicenter platform as well. So we want to address both these audiences. And the way we do that is by having a stack of interface technologies. So what we have is this interface template tool that makes it easy for the loan modeler, or you know, it might not just be one modeler, it might be two or three, but they're people that typically don't have background in either user interface design or HTML that can use the interface templates. And that's what we're going to use next to kind of illustrate that. Um, but if you have a team of people that have more experience, you can drop down to these uh, these lower levels uh, in the stack that give you um, increased flex flexibility at the cost of uh, reduced ease of use, right? So you have to know a little bit more HTML to use Flow.js, and you have to know some JavaScript to use Epicenter and things like that. But what this lets you do is access sort of the rich libraries that are out there on the web for building different graph types and visualizations and connecting into APIs from Google and elsewhere by um, sort of using these JavaScript libraries and things. And you can even do things like create native smartphone or tablet applications. So if you wanted to produce an iOS app that runs on your iPhone, you can do that um, and have it connect to your system dynamics model through uh, Epicenter if you wish. But what I want to do for today is start at the top of the stack here with interface templates and build an example together in about you know 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then uh, we'll see where we go from there. But I want to at least get to that today. So let's start off with that by just taking a look at a, a prepared Vensim model. So this is a very simple Vensim model. I have versions of this in PowerSim and Stella Pro as well. Um, but uh, this one is one we'll use for today. So what you can see here is, um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you as system dynamicists have seen this before. This is a, um, a very simple model. Uh, if I look, the, the goal of this one is total sales. I can graph this out. And what this is producing is, you know, a diffusion model where it's showing sales uh, going up and then peaking and kind of dropping down with the uh, sales lifecycle over time and over 24 months or something like that. And you know you could characterize this as maybe augmented reality um, tools. You know, so maybe we're told that maybe uh, the new iPhone 8 is that right, Gareth? Is that the next iPhone? Yeah, <laughs> iPhone 8 is coming out in I think September, and there's been some speculation that it's going to have augmented reality. And I saw something in the news this morning about Apple stock price being higher than ever uh, as a con as a because of this possibility or some other possibilities with it. So that could be driving. We could talk about the um, the diffusion of uh, the iPhone 8 or augmented reality or something like that as part of this. And you know, if I look at other parts of the model, I can see here's the sales curve over time, and here's the installed base, um, and so on. So um, for each of the tools that you want to upload to Epicenter, there's slightly different approaches that you need to take with it. For Vensim, what you need to do is um, uh, change it to a binary file, and that um, catches people sometimes. So, you know, the default um, mode for Vensim is to save things as a .mdl file, which lets you kind of look at the equations, right? So, if you do, if you're familiar with Vensim, um, you know, the MDL file just is a uh, a list of equations that looks like this, right? Um, without the um, the uh, actual interface in it, or without the sketch. Um, but you can also save files in different formats in Vensim. And one of the formats that allows for, if you look here, is the binary file, which is .vmf, right? So what uh, Epicenter needs to load um, Vensim into Epicenter is the binary format .vmf file, not the .mdl file. So we're going to go ahead and use that. We'll save that here. Um, and um, what I want to do next is go into... Um, into uh, Epicenter. So here's my login for Epicenter. And let me just type in my password. And by the way, there's an opportunity here for creating a free account as well. I'll show you. What I'm, what I'm going to use today is the features of the free account. So you can do something similar when you're uh, trying this out on your own later on. So I'm going to log into my account. OK, so I'm logged in now. And this is what Epicenter looks like. 
Um, you know, initially, of course, it, there wouldn't be all these files in it here. I have a fair number of personal projects, and I also am, have access to Teams. And that's the big designation in Epicenter is this difference between team-based accounts and personal projects. Uh, you can also see, you know, various settings here. I can set up a profile. There's support and documentation available in here and some other things. Um, but what I really want to do here is I want to go into my personal projects right now, and I want to create a new project. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to hit on create a new project here. And I'm going to give this project name. I'm going to call this my AR uh, iPhone simulation, I guess, something like that. That's going to be the name of it. And what this does is, um, when I type in this name, is it converts this into something that is URL friendly, right? So URLs can't have spaces in them. And in general, uh, capitalization is frowned upon. So what it's doing is it's converting this into all lowercase and it's changing the spaces to hyphens. And this is going to be my uh, URL for my app. And it's using my name as the account name here. But if you have a team account, it would use the team name and things like that. And then I can set access for this one to either public or private. In the free account, there are only these two options available for access. In four pay accounts, you get a third option, which is authentication, which means your users can log in to the simulation. And that's useful for doing multiplayer, for example. Or um, also, it's uh, useful for scenarios if you want people to save their scenarios across sessions, meaning if they you know, log out or shut down their computer and they come back to it a day or a week later, the results from their previous runs are still going to be available to them. Um, but I'm using the free version right now, so I'm going to just go ahead. I'll make it publicly available, which means that end users, such as yourselves, if you want to later on, can see um, the can see the interface. Anyone can see the interface, but no one will have access to the model. So we never provide access to the under underlying model for this. So let me go ahead and create a project. And so now I have a URL that has nothing in it right now. And I have these folders sitting over here for creating my interface. Um, so right now, if I look at my model folder, you can see it's empty. There are no files found. And if I look at my interface folder, which contains the interface to the simulation, there's no files either. And I need to populate both of these to get this set up. So the, the distinction here is we separate the interface that's shared online from the model, which is being run, again, in Vensim, uh, Stella Pro, or PowerSim, or something else. So my first step here is just to get a model into this. And there's many ways to do this. I can go here and upload a model or upload a file if I want. I can um, do other things to connect things to my desktop. But a really simple way to do that is simply to, uh, to drag things in. And let me go back here. Oh, that's not where I meant to go. Let's see here. Oh, uh, here we go. This is it. All right, so here I am. Um, and if I take this model.vmf file, I can drag this in. And then you can see the model is in here for right now. So, but now my interface folder is still empty. And I, as I said earlier, I, I might start this where I don't want to write HTML myself. I want the system to do that for me. And the way I'm going to do that is use this interface builder. Um, so when I start interface builder, what, what it does is it gives me um, uh, templates for creating different style of interfaces. And the, the two basic kinds of templates you can create are turn-by-turn-based templates, which means that it's more of a turn-by-turn-based game, kind of like the Econoland simulation that I showed a moment ago. That's one style, right, where you advance from year to year and you see results and things. And then um, the other style, oops, the other style here is the run comparison or scenario-based tool, which is kind of similar to what I'd showed you at the end, which is the HIV or AIDS uh, simulation. So we're going to do a run comparison today because what we're interested in, I suppose, is predicting the sales of uh, augmented reality um, uh, headsets or, or, or tools or something like that. And what Epicenter does, one of the things we've learned, you know, so as I said at the beginning, Forio has been around for about 15 years and we've, um, we've gone through multiple generations of our platform. And through each generation, we've learned different things about how to create something that's going to be really useful for authors as well as for end users. And, uh, in our, um, and one of the things that we're seeing with the evolution of the web is that there's different requirements that are being put on um, end users uh, or required on, on people who are building websites and things that are interactive on the web. And one of the big ones that has come out is that you need things to be smartphone compatible. And so even if your website doesn't work a lot with that, if you want to have um, Google index you at a high level, meaning that you know if, if someone search on a term like 
augmented reality simulation and you want to pop at the top of the list, it, uh, one of the things that Google requires now is that your interface be smartphone compatible. And so what we've done is use our own uh, user interface designers here at Forio to create some looks that can be modified. And so these can be heavily modified, but it kind of starts off with a structure that lets, um, that, that's going to allow you, that's going to provide that um, capability without you having to build it yourself. And it's sort of, it's also outlined in a way too that's going to um, nicely produce a, a functional interface for you. And you can see here, it's kind of making some assumptions about what we might want to build. It has an introduction page, it has a dashboard, it has a decisions page and a run manager and things. We'll get into that in a minute. If I don't like any of those pages, I can remove them. And I also have this ability to add different pages to the interface. So if I want to um, add new pages here, you can see there's lots of different styles of text pages that can be added. And there are other kinds of pages to different input style pages or um, run comparison for this style of simulation, run analysis, etc. So those are all different things that can be added in, and I'm going to do that in a minute. But before I do that, what I want to do is go to the global settings and get some basic things set up for my project. Um, the first thing I want to do is kind of set the header for it and the footer. So what I want to do here initially is give my project a name. I'm going to call this my uh, augmented reality sim. I guess I already have that in there from practicing earlier today. All right, so there's my project title. And I also would like to probably have a, a logo in my header as well. So what I need to do to get that is to add a new image. So let me click on that. And what I can see, what I did earlier here is you can see I have this ar.jpg, which I downloaded, but it's just a, a, a simple JPEG image that I have. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that up and here's what it looks like. And what this does is it allows me to kind of adjust the framing for it a little bit. And so I can make this a little bit bigger here. And then, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hit OK on that, and then I can select it, and that's going to be available in my header. And then I can include a copyright notice if I want. I want to say 2017, you know, Forio if I want to say that, and I can put my name in as the author if I want. I can also, um, you know, put in a a, a web address to um, say, you know, check out Forio or something like that if I want. Down here is external links that are going to appear in the footer. This is these are the footer settings. Um, the other thing I can do is change the setup of the navigation and things. So I want to do that. And lastly, what's neat in here is I can select different themes. So again, a designer has gone through and selected color schemes and fonts that are compatible with each other and that kind of work on different kinds of devices. And it even handles things like if you uh, are working with someone who's colorblind, there's a colorblind theme that's available, but there's other kinds of themes as well, monochromatic modern enterprise, et cetera. So that can change the look of your interface if you want to. All right, so I've got this basic setup. And you know what I've decided, I guess, is that I don't really want to use this dashboard as it's currently designed. I don't like this dashboard. So let me put in a replacement dashboard. Um, what I'm going to do is um, select a run comparison. And what I, I, I'm going to select this style that's kind of one big uh, graph instead of lots of little graphs like I had in here before. So I'm going to go ahead and select this. I'm going to call this dashboard two. It's my new dashboard here. Okay, so I'll call this dashboard two and I'll hit okay. So now I've got a new page for dashboard two. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, we can already see sort of some of this getting filled in here, right? So I've got my augmented reality sim and the logo that I put in earlier that's already appearing at the top, which is good. And I want, let, let me put in one other page in here as well. I'm gonna put in a run analysis, which is a little bit different. And that's gonna let me put a table and a graph together. I'll choose this style and I'll call this my run analysis too, that's fine. I'll keep that name for it. So now I've got a couple of pages that I've added, but they're not actually part of the navigation yet. So I want to add them into the navigation and maybe change out this dashboard. The way I do that is I go to global settings and I go to navigation settings. Um, and then, you know, what I can do is first off, I can get rid of the dashboard bit, which I don't want anymore. So I've deleted that. And then I can add different kinds of navigation items. If I want more items to appear on the top menu, Without a drop down, I can click here to add those. But if I want to have a drop down menu, I can do that. And in this case, what I want to do is create a drop down. I'm going to call this my results section, right? So that's going to be the drop down menu. And then what I want to do is add a sub navigation item. And what I want to do is have one of them be the dashboard. So I'll have the dashboard. And then I want to select is one of the pages that I've created that I want to assign to the dashboard. So in this case, it would be dashboard two. And then I want to add another one, which is. Um, uh, a detailed page, I guess, I'll call it that. Um, and for that one, I'm gonna select Run Analysis 2. 
Okay, so that's my dashboard. Now that's appearing at the bottom. So what I'm going to do is move this up to appear before decisions. So let me do that. Let me go one more up here. Okay, so now I've got introduction, results, decisions, and run manager. That looks good to me. And if I go back to the pages now, you can see that's already put in place. So I go to the introduction, I can click on results, and I now see dashboard and details. I have my decisions page and my run manager. So I'm happy with that as an initial setup. And of course, I can change this later if I want to. So the first thing I want to do then is maybe set up my introduction page. And I'm going to say, you know, say here, welcome to the uh, augmented reality, uh, reality simulation. And, um, and then I have some text here that I can put in. And what I did in advance to kind of move things along for today is create some text here somewhere. There we go. <laughs> All right, so there's my text that I'm just going to paste in here to keep things moving. Um, and then I, I can do things with the text too. I can make certain things bold and so forth. I can also add media. So it, in various things, it lets me add media. I can do images. Since I already did an image, I'll put in a video in this case. And I've already got a video that I've um, found online. It's just a YouTube video. It doesn't have to be a YouTube video, but in this case it is. So I've added this in now. and. That's pretty good. I also have a button down here, and I can change what I want this button to do. Um, so right now, it's a get started. But what do I want to have happen when I click on get started? I can remove it if I want to, but I like that down there. So what I want it to do is I want it to navigate to a particular page in my interface. And in this case, what I'd like it to do is to navigate to dashboard 2. So when they click on get started, I want them to go to the results dashboard 2 page. Um, and that looks good. And I, and I can actually add or string together multiple operations for my get started button. But that's sufficient for now for that one. So let's go to results dashboard and set that up. And um, what I want to do with this is just you know initially create a, a chart type. And um, this is a run comparison bit because I'm creating a run comparison or scenario based simulation. And so I'm going to select a, 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 a line that I want to show. And in this case, what I want to do is show total sales, I think. If I go back to my Vensim model, I can see total sales down here. And that's the variable that I'm interested in. Uh, plotting and what's neat about one of the things that's neat about Epicenter is it has this thing called model introspection, which means that the interface can um, look inside of your model and identify variables that are in there, and then help kind of prompt you to find them in the interface. So what I saw here was I have this total inter, pardon me, total sales variable, and I want to put that in, and you can see it's looking up variables that are in my model right now. If I start to type total sales. You can see it's looking that up for me, and I can identify that. And now it's plotting out that baseline run with that outcome in there. And that looks that looks good to me. So I'm just going to keep that as is. So next, what I might want to do is create a details page. And for my details page, I've got a couple of things I can do. I want to create a chart and also uh, row labels. And um, what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to create another line chart in this case, I guess. I'm going to call this uh, sales details is what I'm going to call it. And I can put, uh, for this one, because I'm showing different results, I can um, plot more than one variable. So what I want to do here, let me go back to my model. I want to plot new sales and repurchases. Because you know new sales plus repurchases equals total sales in my model. So that's kind of the analysis that I want to share. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up new sales here. And there it is. And um, there's the plot for it. I want to add a variable. And I want to call this one repurchases. Was that what it was? Yeah. Repurchases, I'll put that one in there too. And so there it is with those two uh, variables plotted out. And um, then I also have a table below. So I can create this table and kind of set it up. And I can just repeat that, I guess. So I'll do new sales. And the variable is new sales here. Um, and I can set the number format for that if I want to. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and do that. You can see here, actually, here are the numbers that are coming out. But the precision is overly high, right? So I don't want that level of precision in my interface. So I can change the number format here if I want to. I'm going to change that to thousands, and that cleans it up a bit. So let me also put in repurchases. I kind of do the same thing and uh, put that variable in. And I'll also set the number format for that to, uh, to thousands. And then lastly, I'll put in, I guess, total sales. So I can see the total of those two values and type that in. There we go. And also format it. So there we go. So we've got that all set up. Um, and then lastly, to complete my interface, what I want to do is um, have some decisions that the user can make. In Vensim, the way that you make decisions that run in most simulations is you use gaming variables. 
if you're familiar with that concept in Vensim for those of you who use it. So, you know, and um, so there's basically two types of numbers that you can enter in Vensim. You can enter in, um, at the beginning of a simulation, you can enter in constants, um, like market size here, I believe, let me just confirm that, is a constant. Yeah, so that's set up as a constant and it's just a single number that's entered here. Uh, and, um, but I can also do things with, as the simulation is progressing with uh, gaming variables. And the way you do that is you make sure that it's on auxiliary and then a subtype gaming. And then that what that means is it can be changed as the simulation is progressing. So that's how Vensim's approach to that. And each language varies a little bit in terms of their approach, but that's how Vensim works. So uh, that looks good. I think what I wanna do is use purchase probability and market size today for kind of plotting this out. So let me add a decision and I'll initially do purchase probability here. Um, and actually, I went a little bit faster. <laughs> Let me back up. Let's remove component. I'm going to start over. Okay. So what I have here is different types of inputs I can do. I can do a text input, a slider, checkbox, radio buttons. For the purchase probability, a good one to control it is to use a slider. And this is part of the thing, too, that you want to do when you have people that are casual users of your interface. Because, you know, there are people that will do things that are unexpected that you wouldn't do as a modeler but as someone who doesn't know your model might try, like for example, what would happen if I entered a negative purchase probability? Well, we don't want that in here, so we wanna um, add some flexibility to, or some ways of controlling that. So now I have my purchase probability, but again, it's overly precise, so I wanna put in a different uh, format for it. I guess this percent will work fine. And, and by the way, if I don't like this, I can change this format as well. So I can do something like, I can just type in here uh, a formatting, um, and then that's going to create a different style of format for me. And that's kind of a nice feature here. So here I have 5% represented that way. Actually, I really, I don't think, I think I was just want one. Let me just go to the drop down here again. I want to, I want to use the original one just because I like it with one instead of two. And then I can put in the, uh, the minimum and I don't want it actually to never, to ever be zero because then the, the, the model would never grow. I also don't really ever want it to go above 20%. And I, I guess I'll increment by one. So it's going to start off at 5%. I can drag it down to one and as high as 20% in here. So that's one. Um, I also want to put in another input in. And let me do market size just as a different style for that. So I'll do the market size variable. And um, what I'm going to do for this is make it into a text box instead. And the format for this is going to be the 1,000 separated. So there's the 25 million. You can see it's already kind of connecting up everything. All right. So that is our interface. We're done with it. Um, and we can go ahead and go to preview mode now and take a look at what this what this looks like here. So here it's running out and uh, I have my headset on right now, but so you probably can't hear this, but I can play a little bit of the video. Uh, I don't know if you could hear that or not. I could certainly hear it. Uh, but there's the little video, there's my description of it. I can click on get started. And what that does is it shows my baseline results here. I can go to the details page and see you know, details for my baseline as well as outcome for that first run here um, for a particular one. And then I can go to decisions and create a new scenario. So I might try a scenario where I say people purchase slower than before. So this is a slow uptake scenario or something, right? So I can go ahead and uh, save and simulate that. And I can see with the slow uptake, oh, I made a mistake. Well, actually that's good in a sense. Um, I didn't mean to make a mistake, but it's actually good to see that because that's actually something that happens all the time in models I create and probably for most people too. Um, so what I need to do is resolve that and I can dig into details about what it is, but I actually know what happened here, which is if I go to decisions, I forgot to tell it where to go for this sim save and simulate. So you can see that's blank here. Um, and what, what I really want it to do is to go to a page after I'm done. And I think what I want to do is have it go to dashboard too. So that's kind of the main page of it. So let me go ahead and fix that. And that's sort of a useful feature by the way of um, preview mode, right? So. Let me go back now and look at that. So here we are back into that one again. And if I go to results, even though it didn't go to the page, the results are still there and I can see the slow uptake scenario that I created here. Um, so let me go back and do one more. Um, it's remembering the previous um, input that I put in here, which is a nice feature so I can kind of build these up, but I can also hit reset and clear out the, the previous run from it. So maybe I'll try a new scenario where I say the market size you know, doubles and I say this is, uh, big market, this is my big market scenario or something like that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and run that. And now I have this um, sort of other run in here. Um, and I can see, you know, all of these lines kind of together. If I want, I can take out certain ones if I want or put them back in. And then if I go to results on the details, 
you know, and this is sort of a nice feature that it's built in for it, where you can see for um, things that we're selecting, it's going to show different results. Um, and, and this one, because we're showing two at once, it's only showing, uh, it's not showing it as a comparison. Instead, it's showing just results one at a time. And then we also have a run manager that we're kind of getting automatically for this. Whereas if I, you know, I don't like the slow uptake scenario, I can remove it. And now if I go back to results, it won't even show up anymore in my dashboard as an option. And that's sort of the basics of, of generating this. So if I go back to my project homepage, what I can see now is that in the interface folder, there's a bunch of files that have been generated automatically for me. And these files are still editable. So these are files that if I want to, you know, go down to that next level in the stack that I mentioned before and start to edit stuff in HTML, I can do so through Flow.js. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor for how that works, I can click on the index.html. This is the HTML that was generated. And I can go in here and, um, you know, change settings and things like that. So there's, you know, here's the footer. If I want to change that to, you know, change the copyright notice in some way and type in, uh, you know, I don't know, all rights reserved or something like that, uh, I can do so here and save it, you know, and then um, that will appear in the interface from here. And oh, one other thing I forgot to show is, um, you can, oh, by the way, you can, now, so now you can see the footer with all rights reserved that's been put in there. Um, but I, what I didn't show you was how this uh, scales. So there's this, uh, again, this idea that it would work on a smartphone. If I scale this down to uh, this size, what you can see is the menu bar changed, right? So the original menu bar in this looks like this with the drop down and things. Um, but in this new version, what I have when it's, say, on smartphone enabled, I have a drop down where I can see things for the actual dashboard here um, in this format, right? So that's kind of how that's... Um, that that's working and this will still work nicely on a smartphone, which is a great feature for your users and also helps with um, improving your Google search engine results and so forth. All right, I know I'm about out of time. Um, the only other thing I wanna show you today is a little bit around um, that next step. So as I mentioned a moment ago, um, you know, we have these two different users groups. We have team-based and individuals. I wanna show you a little bit of the team-based approach just so you get a sense for what that looks like. And let me show that to you in the context of um, a running simulation. Let's see, if I go to, let me just go to the HIV sim quickly. So here's the HIV simulation that I showed earlier. And what you can see is there's a set of members who are all developers for this particular simulation. Um, and then in addition in here, what we have is this concept of groups where we can create subscriptions where people can, um, we can sign up students, for example, or end users or learners or whoever that are gonna be members and they're gonna be able to access uh, the simulation. And I can do things like say, I wanna expire access after a certain number of months or days or whatever, or I'm gonna limit the number of times they can run it. And so this is a way that you can through Epicenter manage uh, subscriptions and things. So we have about 10 minutes left and I'm gonna go from here just to answering any questions that we have. And Gareth, do we have any questions that come in through the webinar today? Okay, um, fine. I guess we have no questions so far, um, but if there's anything that you guys all have in terms of questions, um, please let me know and uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but I guess if we don't have any questions, um, you know, maybe something that I can do is tell you a little bit of our plans for the future for, um, the uh, uh, for the platform, like what we're planning on doing this fall, that might be interesting. Um, and uh, let's see here. So we've got, um, you know, our plans for, for this year, for, for the rest of the year on here is we're gonna be doing more data visualizations. We have more plans for doing multiplayer, making that easier to use. And one of the things that we're gonna work on is a tutorial for building high production value simulations. So something that's a bit more, um, uh, customized than what I showed for the example today that you're going to be able to do using the Flow.js, which I, I think, and you know, I'm someone who um, uh, is not, I'm not an HTML developer. And actually what I found is that uh, I can work within Flow.js for building interfaces like here. And that actually is a, a place that I really enjoy working. And I think it's a place where other people might like it too. So if you're somebody who, you know, you know, modeling and you're reasonably analytical, but you haven't done HTML before this, this may be a, you start here with a, a interface uh, templates by all means, but then you might consider going to the Flow.js level because there's a lot more things that you can do in, in, in that level going forward. Um, uh, 
Okay, um, Gareth just told me this. Someone who's asked about, can we get access to recorded version of this webinar for later? And uh, yes, you can. So what we'll be doing is shortly after, uh, later on today, at some point later today, we'll convert this um, webinar and we'll save it and then we'll make it available online. And you'll be able to share it with your colleagues if you want to rewatch it, if you want to do that. Oh, interesting. Okay, so uh, Gareth says another question came in. Is it possible to display this in Japanese? And it, yes, it is. And you can see, um, let me show you again here. You know, this one's a good example of that, uh, this, um, this HIV sim, which is in Vietnamese here. So that's one example. But there's also been things like, for example, what um, MIT has done. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Yeah, so these are simulations that MIT has produced on Epicenter. And uh, one of them in here is fish banks. And what you can see is here's fish banks in uh, Chinese, for example. Unfortunately, I can't think of an example off the top of my head that runs in Japanese. But my point is that it's certainly possible to build um, uh, interfaces that are entirely in a, a different language like Japanese. Or, you know, we've done things in Portuguese or French, Spanish, etc. Any other questions, Gareth? That's all I see for right now. All right. Well, I think we'll leave it at that for today. I think the only other thing that's probably worth um, mentioning is that um, if you want to check out more in terms of the team-based accounts and also use authentication so you can control login for your end users, um, you can find out more details by going to forio.com and then go to Epicenter and then go to our pricing link. So the pricing link kind of gives details about how that works. And there's different plans available for um, creating these kind of authenticated team-based accounts. They range from a little under $500 a year up to $10,000 per year. And the, the difference in these is the number of authenticated projects, meaning the number of projects or simulations that you have that have logins for the end users and the number of log uh, allowed end users to log into the simulation. So I'll end uh, there with that today. And like I said, we'll be sending out a notification later on today with more information about how to access this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.